It seems like every other week a new celebrity's shadowy past of crime and degeneracy is being exposed to the masses. However, for Danny Trejo, he was open and honest about his crimes from the very beginning. You see, for the past 40 years, Danny has been typecast as a gangster, a prisoner, or an overall violent Chicano criminal. But he was not playing a character. This is actually who Danny was. For the first 27 years of Trejo's life, if you looked at him the wrong way, yeah, you I can see from the tattoos. might end up in a body bag, which led to him spending most of his days in federal prison. What separates Danny from all the Hollywood criminals who tried to mask their crimes with movies and money is because of what he did after he got out of prison. When you hear Danny's story, you will be shocked he made it out alive, let alone this successful and beloved. Hollywood could not poison Trejo, because he had already been to the lowest point any human could go, and the way he survived this darkness is nothing short yeah, how do you come up with that? of a miracle. Danny Trejo was introduced to heaven at just 12 years old by his uncle Gilbert, who was only crazy? 6 years older than Danny. I caught him shooting him. I, I threatened to tell on him if he didn't give me some. My grandfather was a tyrant, and I remember one time I was like, I was just around about 12, and, and uh, me and my uncle were standing there and my grandfather was screaming at us, and I'm like, because I know he's gonna hit me, and I just, I'm I almost ready to crap my pants, you know, I'm like squeezing so I won't, because I know he's gonna hit me. And and I happened to glance over my uncle, and my uncle is, is, is looking at in the face, and he's like, nodding off. He's nodding. And I'm like, oh my God! Okay, that... no, I'm thinking this is the baddest dude in the world. My grandfather got so mad at my uncle going down like this that he cabron chavanas he did, and he walked into his room, slammed the door, and I'm like looking at Gilbert and Gilbert, and then Gilbert wakes up. Hey, did he hit us? You know, oh. I wanted to be just like that. Yeah. It's interesting that a 12 year old's brain associated nodding off on when as this no, way to become a fearless badass. The reason Danny lived with his grandparents in the first place was because his father obtained full custody of him, then stabbed a man and went to prison, effectively making him an only child to be raised by his gangster grandfather and his delinquent uncle. Things escalated from there, with Trejo developing a dependency and joining Gilbert in robberies and drugs which resulted in a childhood where Danny was in and out of juvenile detention centers. For time I went to juvenile halls at 12, 13, 12 years old, and it was just petty stuff back then or is it uh everything was petty. I mean just anything you did, you know, I I uh, you know fighting and and a strong arm robbery. Like if you take money from a paper boy, it's strong arm robbery. You give me it or I'll beat you up. That's strong arm robbery. You know? So uh -huh. you just you just give me an idea and you're all this actually being good and trouble. Safe, uh... And that was just the way of life. We just got in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, I got I got thrown yeah, this was the earlier interview. Out, out of middle school, but going to junior middle school about eleven times for being intoxicated or loaded or fighting or because you got you had a middle school with four different neighborhoods in it, so. Mm -hmm. And and then the gangs. Were, were you? You, were, you said you were yeah. in a gang, weren't you? Well, well, Pocoima, I was from Pocoima. I uh -huh. was from this neighborhood. So basically, that's the gang. Although today we associate Southern Los Angeles with having a heavily organized gang culture, back in the 50s it wasn't as organized and official. Regardless, Los Angeles was still riddled with very dangerous men who sold drugs, robbed and people as a means to obtain power and control of the neighborhoods they resided in. From robbing liquor stores with live Danny Trejo just thought this was a normal way to live. Two sailors, they got shitty with the girl I was with. And so I started fighting and uh, a fight to me is to win. So I, I grabbed a bottle and I, I, I they were hurt. And uh, they escalated quickly. I left. and. Then the cops came, picked me up, and and uh, I, I, I remember I had on a yellow shirt and a pair of khaki pants, and I put them down and went to bed. They were like just covered in, you know. And so I remember said the cops said, "Where that?" You know, put me back in the. Cause I went to get some different clothes, and then we went 
back to jail. Danny would be arrested and incarcerated multiple times throughout his youth, and in that time he developed a reputation as someone you did not want to mess with. So I started building the reputation of being somebody you don't mess with way back in juvenile hall. And, and people talk, juvenile hall, camp, youth authority, uh, prison, your reputation follows you. And, and it's good to have a bad reputation. <laughs> the holiday season is here and you're probably looking for that perfect, unique gift for friends and family. And it looks amazing. The device is, it's a gift slash patch. It's the perfect addition to the QR code of Danny's life story. During a brief stint in the county in 1961, Trejo even crossed paths with the notorious cult leader Charles Manson, mm -hmm. describing him as a dirty, greasy, scrawny white boy. However, once Trejo reached adulthood, the consequences of his actions would be more severe. And in 1965, when Trejo was just 19 years old, he finally met his fate. While he maintains that it was nothing but sugar to this day, Danny was arrested for selling to federal agents working undercover, yes, who got him. which earned him a 10-year prison sentence. But Danny did not fear prison. He had already spent most of his days behind bars, and this is where he expected his life to lead to. When you got to prison, though, what, what did uh, was that a fearful thing for you? No, because what you, was that like the first time you, you actually went to the? Big, Tony, if you grow up in the system, uh -huh. okay, it's it's like you, like you, okay, you played pop. Well, I don't know if you played pop Warner. Yeah, I played pop, okay, Warner. Played pop Warner. Warner. Then you played high school. Then you played college. Then you went to the to the to the NFL. So now when you got you weren't afraid. You were like oh anxious because you knew most of the guys there. You know, you knew some of the guys on the team, and it's a, that's, that's the same thing with. I was in juvenile hall. I was in camp. I was in youth authority. When I got to the bit, <laughs> what's up, home dog? You really? Know, it's, mm. So it's it's a it's the same kind of just kind of a alternate universe. As a fresh face, Trejo used his boxing training from his childhood to his advantage. His teenage scraps were now saving his life, as his prowess in San Quentin was on full display for any challenger in the yard to test. Being a good boxer got me through the penitentiary. I was the lightweight and welterweight champion at every penitentiary I was in. Now being a boxing champion in prison sounds like some sort of made up movie plot, but once upon a time in America, the uh, prisons actually put somewhat of an effort to reform inmates, which include and this with that included money and resources for them to participate in organized sports. We used to have like fights with the the the, the army and the navy would come in sometimes. Do oh, they would be exhibitions, you know, but the only problem is that damn Mexicans don't understand the exhibition. You know, they'll come up, we got money on your homes. No, wait, it's an exhibition. No, they, they don't touch it. We got money, homes. And so you either had to tell the guy that you were fighting, look, homes, go for what you know, you know, or <laughs> surprise him, you know what I mean? If, if he looked up, surprise him. And, uh, but we had some great fights. We had some great fights up there. They took all the, all the athletics out of prison. Fight, you know, they, they don't have no more. Now it's, now it's just a, a warehouse for insanity. You know? Trejo managed to figure out and survive in the complicated politics of prison life because he knew any day in there could be his last. If people know you really believe that the bottom line to an argument is a murder, well, then they don't want to argue with you. And if you believe that in your heart, then it's like you don't argue. It's like you teachers, there is no such thing as I'm getting mad now. There is happy, sad, and rage. That's it. And you can go from happy to rage or sad to rage because there's no, I, I'm going to get mad. Because if I'm going to get mad at you, that probably means you're going to sneak up behind me and sneak in the back. So let's get this over with right away. Don't you think that Ali for good behavior? I don't understand. Prison is the most right now place there is. There's no future, there's no past. It's like right now, you can die because somebody you didn't know didn't get a letter or got a letter. He can just be running down the tier and see you and 
it's it's like that quick unfortunately he realized that life behind bars was turning him into a monster he did not even recognize himself if you're gonna be a predator then then you become somewhat of a sociopath somewhat yes. of an unfeeling screw them they had you we got i remember i remember a, a, an incident where we were playing dominoes right there was we we're playing dominoes before the big game because there's a lot, a lot of money on it and i got a run of fives and anybody that knows dominoes i got four fives in my hand and i'm like look at and right here this guy watched this guy that was watching it had snitched on some and so boom 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 they hit him about six times in the back with a knife bang 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 and he falls on the domino table right and I got this run of fives. And I remember going, oh my God, wait, no, wait. I'm trying to push this guy. When somebody gets okay. stabbed, Rob, you you know, you have to get away from there. Because right. if you're near there, you did it. Right. right. Do you understand? So I'm like, no, no, wait, wait. I'm in. Everybody's come on. And they, we got away. Uh, I got back to my cell with this damn run of fives. Everybody had thrown their dominoes away. They last, right. I got into my cell. I still got this damn run of fives. And I was laying there in my cell and it hit me. What am I becoming? Despite Danny knowing how to navigate the system, make the right connections, and physically defend himself, he would land himself in some trouble that nearly got him the death penalty. At Soledad State Prison in 1968, the prison baseball team was able to organize an exhibition game against an outside baseball team composed of free citizens. It was Cinco de Mayo, which meant that all of the Mexicans in the prison were drinking, partying, and doing drugs. We were like on the third base bleachers here. Third base was just right there. And we're looking at him and he's chewing gum. We're not allowed gum in the penitentiary. Ray had come down from Tescadero. He had a He came down and he was like looking at this guy chew gum. And he was like almost like a little kid. Danny, I want some gum. Hey, puto, give me some gum. You know, this guy turns up. I can't. They told us not to give you guy, and that's as far as he got. Uh -huh. Pow! Ray socked it. When something happens in the pen, it just blows up. After his fellow inmate punched the third baseman, all hell broke loose. Hundreds of inmates everywhere began fighting, which looked like a riot. And during the chaos, it was alleged that Danny Trejo hit a guard with a rock, an offense that got him sent to solitary confinement, aka the hole. The environment of solitary confinement is hauntingly yeah, oppressive, a good. space designed to strip away every sense of normalcy and human connection. Trejo kept himself occupied occupied by revisiting his favorite films in his head, occasionally acting out scenes from The Wizard of Oz to keep his mind busy. On the brink of insanity, it was at this moment that Danny realized his life was over. He had officially reached rock bottom. He sat in a cell where God Sucks had been written in on the wall, but reaching out to God seemed like the only in the plausible world? action to take. And I remember just asking God, let me think that he, mm -hmm. Lord, just let me, I got a reputation with dignity i will say your name every day and i will do whatever i can for my fellow man that was my my spot and his prayers were answered in a much better way than he anticipated none of the 3,000 inmates came forward to corroborate the claim made against him that he threw a rock at the guard's head during a riot thus all charges against him were dropped trejo was released for parole in august of 1969 oh, the 25 year old had no plan and no real prospects for the future but he was determined to leave 10 years of crime behind him and prove he was worthy of a second chance he returned to pacoma where his uncle Gilbert tried to lure him back into the game as a drug dealer. Trejo refused. He was focused on trying to become yeah, how get into a better person and assimilate back into society. He began working odd jobs in junkyards and even started a gardening business. However, he was able to develop a stable income becoming a drug counselor for recovering addicts at Western Pacific Med Corp, a place where he still works to this day. His life was not sexy, it was not exciting, but it was humble, safe, and much better than being behind bars. For 16 years time. straight after being released from prison, Trejo stayed much more than 50 of committed to his promise. He remained sober and dedicated his life to helping others. And it was actually because of one of his noble deeds that he accidentally got a Hollywood career in exchange. Danny mentored a young actor that he met at a 
an anonymous meeting, which if you don't know are meetings that recovering addicts attend to surround themselves with others who can relate to and provide comfort with their struggles. Well, one day in 1984, this young actor who was being mentored by Trejo called him and asked him to come to the movie set because a lot of people were doing cocaine and he was struggling with temptation. Danny went down to watch over the young man and make sure he didn't relapse. Little did Danny know he was about to get himself his first acting gig at the age of 41. I walked on this set and this guy said, hey, you want to be in this movie? And he's like, where let him? He goes, what do I got to do? He's like Samuel L. Jackson. Do, he says, do you want to be an extra? I said, extra what? <laughs> he says, can you act like a convict? <laughs> so I'll give it a shot. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of funny. It's almost like, you know, this is your life. And I took off my shirt. I got that big tattoo on my chest. I'll never forget. That guy goes like, he goes, wait a minute. He goes, I'm thinking, what kind of stupid gang sign is that? You know I mean, I'm thinking, I, 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 I gave him a piece. <laughs> the film was called Runaway Train, an action thriller centered around two escaped convicts. On the set, there was a man named Eddie Bunker that recognized Danny from his boxing days at San Quentin. Eddie asked Danny if he could train the star of the movie, Eric Roberts, how to box for the film, and offered him more money in one day training this guy than Danny would typically make in a week. After seeing how well Danny trained Eric, and since Danny looked exactly like an actual criminal, the director realized it made more sense for him to be Eric's opponent in the film. Runaway Train opened the door for Danny to get more acting roles. I played like inmate number one. From extras to actual boxing mess. Or bad guy number one. Or, okay. or kill literal, or number one. Or tattooed guy number one. You know, I always had these. But, but the director would see me and I was sag. So he would say, say a line. You know, so that's where I got my training. Really the first five years of my career, I'd say like, or I kill that son of a and that's wow that was perfect you know, he loved the way i said it I said, i've said it before ironically trejo was getting paid to pretend to be the person he had been for years which is what made his roles in films like heat con air and blood in blood out so believable you have to keep in mind that trejo was not enamored by the glitz and glam of hollywood sure he liked acting but by no means was he like the theater kids who grew up since 12 years old dreaming to one day be on a movie set he looked at this like an easy job that paid better than anything he could land with his criminal background. It was the other people around him, directors and producers, that saw much more potential than him just being tough prisoner number one. The first movie where he actually had a name was Death Wish 4, as Art Sanella. On this set, he made friends with Charles Bronson, who invited him to do another movie called Forbidden Subjects. Making friends and getting referrals was the way Trejo got more work. He basically said yes to every job, leading him to a different movie set every other month. Everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. This was his way of life for about 10 years until he finally got a more substantial role that actually gave him a name in Hollywood. And the crazy part is, he didn't even speak. Desperado is a 1995 film directed by Robert Rodriguez, which follows El Mariachi, a guitar-toting gunslinger seeking revenge mm -hmm. against a drug lord. Along his journey, he meets Carolina, played by Salma Hayek, who becomes his love interest and ally. Trejo was given the role of Navajas, a fearsome assassin hired by the drug lord Bucho to eliminate El Mariachi. Navajas wields throwing knives with deadly precision. He tracks down Mariachi and nearly kills him, but Mariachi narrowly escapes after a brutal fight that became one of the most iconic and memorable scenes in the film. Desperado grossed $58 million worldwide on a $7 million budget. Trejo's role as Navajo gave him global recognition without having a single word of dialogue. Rodriguez gave me a compliment one time and he said, you can say more with your face than most actors can say with a page of dialogue. Nice That's a hell of a compliment, you know, and, and it's funny, but that takes practice because like in San Quentin, sometimes I think you got to be able to say, hey, I'll kill you without saying a word. Also on the set of Desperado was when Danny met Salma Hayek, the woman who had a near one-to-one -one resemblance of the woman he had tattooed. Danny's chest has become an iconic piece of his image. The artist, named Harry, was an inmate Danny met at San Quentin, who asked Danny if he could do his very first tattoo on him with a guitar string. And I was doing forever. So Harry said, hey, let me do this tattoo, Danny. So we did the outline. Right. And then when he does the outline, I get caught up in some shit. 
in prison in Quentin and they send me to Folsom. So he says, don't let anybody touch it. I'll, I'll be in Folsom. I'll be in Folsom. I said, okay. So, so I got to Folsom. I was there. And then about six months later, he showed up. How did he get into Folsom? He just got <laughs> kicked out <laughs> of running San thing. Quentin. You know? <laughs> so, How do you get kicked out of San Quentin prison? It's funny when he got to Folsom. Hey, it's trail here. It's trail here. <laughs> so, so he did the rest of it, some of it in, in, in Folsom. And then the... There's a big riot in, in, in a race riot in Folsom, and they sent me to Soledad. And he said, Danny, please, man, this is my first tattoo. Let me finish it. Let me finish. <laughs> so you went to three prisons yeah. to get that tattoo. Danny didn't realize it yet, but after 10 to 12 years in Hollywood, he was officially being typecast. Charles Ramirez Berg, a film professor at the University of Texas at Austin, outlined six stereotypes that have defined the representation of Latinos in film over the past century in his book, Latino Images in Films. There's the bandito, the harlot, the buffoon or clown, the Latin lover, and the dark lady. Historically, these archetypes have functioned as a way of putting Latino characters in a box. These archetypes often mocked them, or confined them to roles in which they're the foil or sidekick to a white lead. For most of his career, Danny Trejo played the part of the bandito, someone whose scars and brown complexion were enough to suggest that he was a bad man, with little to no backstory or dialogue about his life or motivation. However, Trejo does not resist being typecast. The first time I was ever really interviewed, she says, Danny, don't you think you're being typecast? Oh, what, what do you mean? That's what? Well, you're always playing the mean Chicano dude with tattoos. And I thought about it, and I said, well, I am the mean Chicano dude with tattoos. Go with what you got. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't make a good call. Salesman. Buy this drug. <laughs> in fact, throughout his career, Danny has purposely gone out of his way to take the role of the bad guy with the stipulation that they have to or go to prison to illustrate to the audience the potential consequences of living a and crime-ridden life, which is quite literally the exact opposite of the contracts that The Rock and Vin Diesel have where they can never lose a fight and they can also never die. Trejo officially holds the record yeah, tell, tell of the most on-screen deaths of any actor, surpassing Christopher Lee's record with 65 deaths to his name. However, Robert Rodriguez felt it was finally time to show the world the honest, humble, and inspiring man Trejo could be, and that character was portrayed in possibly his most iconic role of his entire career. Spy, Spy Kids. Kids is a family action adventure film that follows Carmen and Juni Cortez, two kids who discover their parents are retired spies and must save them when they're kidnapped by a madman named Floop. The film blends comedy, high-tech gadgets, and thrilling action in a kid-friendly format. Danny Trejo's character, Machete, is Carmen and Juni's inventive uncle. Machete became a fan favorite for his resourcefulness and tough persona. Thank you for letting us stay here while we ponder our parents' terrible fate. If you weren't a Cortez, I wouldn't be doing this much. So family does mean more to you than money? No. Dad misses you too. Financially, Spy Kids was a major success, grossing over $147 million on a $35 million budget, leading to a very successful franchise with several sequels. Culturally, it was praised for representing a Latino family in a positive, empowering way. Kids all around the world were now fans of Trejo, and as you know, once you sort of become like a childhood hero, or at least a part of somebody's childhood, you basically have fans for life. There were an over overwhelming amount of youngsters going up to Trejo in public, calling him Uncle Machete and asking for autographs. And it was because of his role as Uncle nice. Machete which led to Trejo getting his biggest leading man role of his entire career. In 2007, Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino's double feature, Grindhouse, featured a fake trailer for a film called Machete. Rodriguez created the over-the-top, gritty trailer as a tongue-in-cheek homage to 1970s exploitation films, featuring Trejo as Machete, a badass, knife-wielding ex-federal agent. The trailer was such a hit with audiences that fans demanded a full-length movie. Danny and I couldn't go down the street without people asking for the movie. People needed it. They wanted a Latino character because they'd never seen it before. And it was like, 
yeah, why doesn't that exist? And so, they got to work. Machete later premiered in 2010. Trejo is the action star who seeks revenge against corrupt politicians and criminals who have wronged him. The film boldly tackled controversial issues like immigration, racism, and the exploitation of undocumented workers. For the first time, Danny Trejo was the hero. His character is the romantic lead, the one that everyone in the audience is rooting for, without having to be the Latin lover type. As far as Hollywood fame and success, Danny was officially at the peak of his career. Now most people in Trejo's position would probably expect to just become this massive action star or at the very least getting offers for more leading man roles. But that wasn't the case. Trejo continued to accept tertiary roles and one-liners and everything from small indie films to blockbuster smashes. Danny could not care less about being the main character on screen or being typed cast or living up to some superfluous status that that celebrities try so hard to maintain. He was simply grateful to be a part of any project that was offered to him. Considering his life was destined for failure from the start, living a drug-addicted, crime-riddled existence in prison made him appreciate his second chance in an entirely different way, and he was gonna make the most of it. Danny started a chain of restaurants called Trejo's Tacos. The first restaurant opened in Los Angeles in 2016, and since then, his culinary venture has expanded to include other locations, as well as Trejo's Cantina, a cookbook, a successful one. book, and Trejo's Coffee and Donuts. At those establishments, customers can find his own line of hot sauces. While most celebrity side ventures turn into seemingly quick cash grabs, Danny's passion and genuine love for food has led to his products and restaurants being extremely highly rated. Trejo also ventured into the beer industry with his own brand of craft beer called Trejo's Cerveza. He even launched a record label called Trejo's Music. But make no mistake, despite Danny indulging in the fruits of his labor, he has remained humble. Just a few years ago, he saved a baby from an overturned vehicle. He was nearby when a car got into an accident and the 75-year-old ran over to help the victims. A villain in the movies, but a hero in real life. Hollywood and social status mean nothing to Danny Trejo. Even though he enjoys acting, he feels it's just a job that allows him to provide a decent life for his three kids. Kids. Today, at 80 years old, he is grateful to be safe and 51 years sober. Not to mention, he still remains a drug counselor for others struggling with addiction to this day. That genuine authenticity is what makes people want to work with him more. It also makes him stand out from the phonies he is surrounded by. Trejo continues to have conversations with God. I talked to God a couple of days ago and I said, how am I doing? And he said, you're almost out of hell. Keep it up. Okay, You're doing nice. great. 